All right. Um, so, uh, so like I was saying, uh, measles is one of the diseases that is very important for us to uh, look at at this point of time because it is something that, uh, you know, has been boggling all of us, the medical fraternity, and because it keeps coming back again and again. So uh, why we need to talk about measles at this point in time, I just want to share a few uh, statistics with you all. Uh, we all know that COVID happened. And uh, because of COVID, there was a lockdown and everyone was stuck inside the house. And because of that, a lot of children were not able to get their routine vaccinations done. And because of that, uh, almost 40 million children, uh, it was recorded that they have missed their measles vaccine dose in 2021. And out of that, almost 2 crore children have missed their vaccine dose in India itself. So this is a huge number, which it also means that these 40 million children all around the world are also susceptible to diseases like measles, mumps, rubella, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, and all of those diseases which are actually protected. Uh, kids are protected because of the vaccination. And uh, in 2021, that was during the pandemic, that is during the second wave of the pandemic, there were almost 9 million cases and um, 128,000 deaths from measles worldwide. And almost 22 countries had uh, large outbreaks as well. So basically the reasons for this again was because there was a low vaccine coverage. A lot of people were not getting vaccinated. A lot of children were not getting vaccinated. Measles surveillance had come down. So, uh, so uh, there was so much of uh, importance given to COVID that diseases like measles were uh, almost neglected. And uh, there were also delays and interruptions in immunization activities as well because of COVID-19. And this also continued in 2022. Uh, in 2022, India has had the highest number of cases of measles in the world, which, uh, with uh, 9,489 cases as on November uh, 2022. It might have crossed 10,000 by now. Uh, it is much higher uh, compared to just 5,000 cases in 2020 and 5,000 cases in 2021, which means that definitely we are battling an uh, epidemic of measles which we need to address and uh, tackle. Uh, measles anywhere is a threat everywhere, you know, because measles spreads very easily. Almost 95%, 90% uh, of uh, secondary uh, attack happens. So what happens is uh, anybody who's, uh, there's there's a 90% chance of somebody who is exposed to measles to get the, get the vaccine, get the infection. But then it's also a disease which is entirely preventable by vaccination, which is why it's important for us to uh, stress on immunization because it's a, it's a simple thing. Prevention is very easy. Uh, but then if we do not prevent it with the vaccination, then the, uh, then the consequences are quite grave. So it's important for us to have a coverage of 95% or greater of, of two doses of the vaccine if we want to create a herd immunity in order to protect our communities. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, just a recap, I'm sure all of us know this, but just want to recap uh, what uh, this measles is and from where it comes and what is the etiology and the pathogenesis of this. So as we all know, measles is caused by an RNA virus, which belongs to the paramyxovirus family. Um, it's a highly contagious virus. And like I said earlier, the secondary attack rate is almost 90%, which means that 90% of uh, there's a chance of a person um, spreading the infection is almost more than 90%. And it's very common in children, especially the preschool children. Infants are usually protected because they have transplantal antibodies, which uh, get transferred to them by their mothers, which is active till nine months of age, which is also the reason why we give the measles vaccination at nine months of age, because till then the child is protected by the vaccination. Uh, the incubation period of measles is from six to 21 days. And uh, transmission is uh, uh, by droplet infection, droplet uh, transmission. So nasal secretions, oral secretions uh, are what will transfer the disease. And uh, the, it usually happens uh, five days before and four days after the rash. So a person is infective from five days before the rash appears until four days after the rash has appeared. And uh, what happens is the virus enters through the respiratory tract, or it can also enter through the conjunctiva, through uh, the uh, eye secretions. And it can it will multiply in the respiratory epithelium, causing a primary viremia. And then the infection spreads to the reticular endo endothelial system through the blood. And this results in the secondary uh, viremia. And this is what causes the systemic symptoms like fever, 
uh, rash and all of those things. And uh, usually during the incubation period, the, the patient, uh, the, the person is uh, asymptomatic. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, maybe we can just answer this question. Maybe some, if any of the attendees could uh, please answer. Suppose a one-year-old baby is brought to your clinic with fever since two days and uh, redness of the eyes and running nose. Um, what are some of the questions that you would ask for when you look for the history? Uh, so I request all the attendees, if you want to uh, answer anything, please write it down in the chat box. We'll be taking it from there. We'll be letting your response to us. Please write it down in the chat box or the Q&A session. We'll just give a minute for everyone to maybe respond to this. Sure, doctor. We'll just give a minute. Uh, we got an answer from Dr. Ruhina. Any family history of fever as it can be a viral infection? Masu, okay, can yes, also answer good. any contact having the same symptoms? Okay, so basically we try and find out if there are others who have had similar symptoms uh, like fever and all that, yes. Uh, we'll ask for immunization against measles, yes. What would be the one examination that we would do? What is the one thing that we would look for in a in a uh, you know in a baby like this? Okay, somebody says coplic spot. Very good. All right. So I think we can just go ahead and answer these questions. Uh, shall we go to the next slide? Yes, uh, so thank you everyone for giving your answers. Yeah, so what is this? I think this is like uh, Dr. Maksud Khan answered. This is a coplic spot. Um, I'll tell you more about it in the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, so clinical features of measles uh, is very characteristic of the infection. Uh, there are a lot of viral fevers which have rashes and each of these viral fevers have their own characteristic features, the way they appear, how they appear, when they appear. Uh, and that is what helps us in differentiating between whether it is measles or whether it is dengue or whether it's rubella or mumps or, or any of these viral examples. So measles also has its own um, characteristic feature in the way it appears and the way it spreads and the way it gets better. So we can always divide every viral fever into a prodromal phase and an exanthematous phase and the recovery phase. So what happens is the initial after the incubation period is done, you know, incubation period is almost from six to 21 days, like I said earlier, could be anything between that. So once the incubation period is over and the, and the baby go or, or the patient goes into the uh, uh, prodromal phase, it usually lasts for two to four days, wherein the patient will have fever, the patient will have malaise and anorexia, and this will be followed by symptoms like running nose, uh, congenital congestion, like watering of the eyes or redness of the eyes, as well as a dry sort of a cough. So this is very, uh, uh, at this point of time, it's very difficult for us to say whether this is measles or not. But in a place where there is a history of measles, or if a place is endemic for measles, we always have to consider this as one of the diagnosis. And uh, during the prodromal phase, that is one thing that helps us in uh, sort of identifying if this is measles, and that is the coplic spots. So coplic spots usually appears on the second or the third day of fever, which is during the prodromal phase itself. So what are these coplic spots? These are small lesions, uh, like what we saw in the earlier slide. They'll be around 1 to 3 mm in size. They'll be whitish um, colored lesions, which we see in the buccal mucosa, and typically on the uh, towards the lower second molars. But then it can, of course, spread towards the entire uh, buccal mucosa as well over a period of time. And this usually takes almost 12 to 72 hours to resolve, and it slowly uh, sort of resolves. So whenever a child comes to us in our clinic with uh, fever for two days with some respiratory symptoms, we should not just dismiss it as a viral fever or as a viral respiratory infection, but we should always do an oral examination to look for a coplic spots. 
uh, uh, definitely complex spots is not something that you will see in every single case of measles. But if a patient has complex spots, then it is pathognomonic of measles. That means that the child or the patient is having uh, measles. So that is why complex spots is very important for us. Um, and then what happens is after the prodromal phase is over, which is the first two to four days, on the fourth day, the patient will start having a rash. And during the and the fever is also still there, and the rash appears. And the rash is also a typical rash. It's an erythematous maculopapular blanching sort of a rash. When I say blanching rash, what it means is that when you press on that area and you remove your finger, then there will be a uh, blanching that happens, and then the and it gets filled with blood again. So that is a blanching rash. And this is very typical of measles, where it, it starts with the face and then spreads face and then the behind the cheeks and in the neck and behind the ears and all, and then slowly spreads downwards. So it spreads to the neck and then to the chest and then to the extremities, trunk, thighs, and the legs. And uh, this is uh, the way the rash spreads. And this will spread over a period of two to three days. So initially the lesions will be blanching. As, a, as the rash gets older, it, the blanching effect will not be there. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, also during this time, during the exanthematous phase, the patient will also have high fever, uh, typical of a viral fever. They can have a lymphadenopathy, they can have lymph node enlargements, and they can also have other respiratory symptoms like a sore throat, uh, pharyngitis, uh, they can have cough, uh, and also conjunctivitis. Uh, sometimes in very severe cases of measles, we do see generalized lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly as well, because the lymph, lymph nodes and the lymphatic system is uh, involved, right? It spreads through the reticuloendothelial system. So that is why there will be a lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly sometimes. So after the rash has appeared, typically after around 48 hours, that is two days, the, the rash starts to fade in the same order that it had started. So it starts off with the face and it starts disappearing also with the face. So again, it follows the same order, face, neck, trunk, um, extremity, uh, trunk, thighs, and the extremities, and then it, it gets better. That is usually a desquamation that happens. That is the peeling of the skin that happens. And within 10 days, the rashes disappear. And the patient starts recovering. Uh, sometimes cough can persist for one or two weeks post measles. So um, usually if the fever persists for more than four days after the rash has appeared, then that means that there's probably some sort of a measles associated complication as well. So measles in itself, uh, you know, the, 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 the viral disease itself might not be very dangerous in the sense like uh, it's a simple thing wherein a, uh, the child will have fever and then have rash and then get better within four or five days. But then why measles is so important important is because measles has associated morbidity and mortality with it. Measles results in a lot of complications, which, which is what makes measles a dangerous disease. And uh, the, the, the good news is that immunity after measles viral, uh, virus infection is thought to be lifelong. There can be, sometimes there can be a reinfection, but then it's, it's very, very uh, rare. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, there can be different presentations in measles. One is a classical measles infection, which I just described. This is something that we see in immunocompetent individuals, that is normal uh, children. Uh, sometimes you can have a modified measles as well. This happens uh, when the patient has a uh, partial protection because of a partially protective uh, anti-measles antibody, either because of a previous infection or because of half immunization, or sometimes if the patient has received some immunoglobulin therapy or something, then the, they will have a modified measles. Modified measles basically is they'll have similar symptoms, but then it will be very mild and the disease will not be as contagious as a classical measles. Atypical measles is another uh, syndrome that we see, or it's another presentation. This is seen in patients who were immunized with a killed virus vaccine. So now what we use is the live attenuated vaccine. But earlier, before 1967, they were using the killed uh, virus vaccine, which was also giving an incomplete protection. And so uh, those people, if they're getting infected with the measles infection, then they may have an atypical measles. But of course, it's been so many years now, so it's quite rare. We don't see a lot of that nowadays. Uh, there can also be neurological syndromes. I'll be talking about this uh, following a measles infection wherein there's a lot of nerve and uh, neurological involvement that happens. And uh, in the immunocompromised individuals, there can be a severe measles infection with um, things like uh, uh, with other complications happening as well. Yeah.